91.3 WVKR. Independent Radio, Poughkeepsie, New York. It's four o'clock on the nose end. Hope you enjoyed listening to Frank's Vinyl Triumph here today. It's always nice having him preempt local motion, which is what you are now tuned into. I am your host, Rita Ryan, here each and every Wednesday from 4 to 6 p.m. Yay! Show number 258 for me on these airwaves at WVKR. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in, whether it's on the dial at 91.3 or online, WVKR.org, or tune in however it is you're here. Appreciate you being here on this very special day in our nation's country. Another present president was inaugurated, and it's great to see our democracy at work. So, With that said, this show is all about music, and it's about music of the Hudson Valley, musicians that live here, those coming to perform in our area venues, as well as those coming to record in our world-class area recording studios. I am so thrilled to have with me, especially on this national day, um, the legendary folk musician, Mr. Happy Traum, will be my guest today. Yay! Thank you, Frank. (laughs) Happy has been on the show before. And um, every time I get the opportunity to speak with him, it's like I'm getting a lesson in folk music history. And that undoubtedly will happen with Happy today. He's got a couple of things coming up this weekend, Friday, live stream and Sunday. He's got an online guitar workshop. We're going to talk all about Happy's career, play some of his music, and enjoy spending this hour with the legendary Happy Traum. I'm going to start the show off now with some of his music. This uh, track that we're playing comes off his latest release, Just for the Love of It, which was released back in 2015. And this uh, release actually received a very rare four-star review from the Rolling Stones. So let's take a listen to Deep Blue Sea, right here, right now, 91.3 WVKR. Deep Blue Sea, baby. Deep Blue Sea. Deep blue sea, baby Deep blue sea Deep blue sea, baby Deep blue sea It was Willie What got drowned In the deep blue sea Dig his grave with a silver spade. Dig his grave with a silver spade. Dig his grave with a silver spade. It was Willie what got drowned in. And lower him down with a golden chain. Lower him down with a golden chain. Lower him down. It was Willie what got drowned in the deep blue
in a silken shroud Wrap him up in a silken shroud Wrap him up in a silken shroud It was Willie what got drowned in the deep WVKR, Independent Radio, Poughkeepsie, New York. Happy Traum, just for the love of it. Deep Blue Sea. Let's get Happy on the line. Happy? Hi there. I'm Hi here. there. Yay. Thank you. Hi, Thank Rita. you. Thank you. Hi, Happy. Nice to have you. I'd like to do a brief introduction, if I may, in case some listeners, listeners aren't familiar with you. So let me just start off by saying renowned folk musician, writer, teacher, and recording artist Happy Traum was an important part of the legendary Greenwich Village folk scene. He's played throughout the U.S., Canada, Europe, Australia, and Japan, both solo and with his late brother Artie Traum, whom he performed with for over 40 years. Happy has appeared and or recorded with Bob Dylan, Levon Helm, John Sebastian, Larry Campbell, Eric Anderson, Allen Ginsberg, just to name a few. One of America's best-known guitar instructors, Happy has produced over 500 music lessons on DVDs and CDs for his internationally known company, Homespun Music in the Instruction. Happy has two live stream events coming up, one this Friday, January 22nd, and an online guitar workshop for Chicago's famous Old Town School of Folk Music on Sunday the 24th. And with that, I welcome you back to Local Motion. Mr. Happy Traum. Thanks, Rita. Nice to be here with you. It's nice to have you here. You know, the last inauguration, um, I did my show on inauguration. It just happened to be that because it's on Wednesdays. And um, I had John Hall on. And oh, that's, that's good. Yeah. 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 That was pretty fitting for <laughs> for that. And today it's you. And um I feel a lot better than I would than John Hall would have four yeah. years ago. Yeah, yeah. I think I think <laughs> I, I feel so good. I feel so good today. I feel like it's a national holiday. Yeah, yeah. You I th- I think I I think you're right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so you know, the last time I felt this way was I think in January of 2009 when we watched Obama get sworn in the, for the first time. Yes. You know, and that was so moving and and just emotional. Yeah. And I, I didn't think that this one would be, I mean, this is even more so because we came out of such a dark time and I'm just, to, I was, I've just been so moved all day today yes. just thinking about that ceremony. Yes. It was just beautiful. And the diversity and the young 22 year old poet laureate oh, and unbelievable. the pastor yeah. just, 
everything about it was class act the music you know you had country star garth brooks and pop star Mm -hmm. lady gaga and j-lo and it's just it was uh it was just beautiful and you know what was unique because normally there's tens of thousands of people out there but yet it felt so intimate and it felt just as as beautiful as, as if there were that many people out there yeah, yeah, it was it was beautifully done. There was not a cringy moment <laughs> right. in the whole the whole thing. I just I I just thoroughly just sat back and you know was teary eyed the whole time. Yeah, yeah, no, it was beautiful. So again, just thank you for your time here today on this special day. I feel you're part of American musical history, so I it's really fitting that you're here today. So let's start off happy. You are a New Yorker, a native New Yorker grew up in the Bronx, I correct? Am. That's right. I am a native New Yorker. <clears throat> um, although I've lived here in the Hudson Valley and the Catskills, you know, in Woodstock for, you know, way longer than I ever lived in New York at this point. Right. Over, over, over 50 years. But, but my, in, in my heart, I guess you're always, you always feel like where you originally came from. And, and the streets of New York is probably, where I feel like I came out of mostly. I grew up in the Bronx, as did Jane, my wife. Um, did you know grew each up other? In blocks. Uh, not as children, just later on in college years we did. And we lived literally like half a mile from each other. Amazing. With our, you know, in our parents' uh, apartments. So, yeah, we've known each other now for 62 years. Or Amazing. Right? And tell me how long you've been married. It's been. Uh, one of those long, yeah, it's long been, marriages. It's been six, 60 years, yeah. Not everybody can do that. Congratulations to yeah. both you and Jane. Thank that's you. beautiful. Yeah. Wow. That's incredible. Yeah. That's something yeah. something very, very special that you guys have for sure. And I know that you have wonderful children and grandchildren. And We do. Uh, we do. You're a very blessed man. Yep. I, I agree. I am. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I, so I came out of New York uh, and the, the Bronx in particular, which didn't seem like a cultural oasis at, in those days. And it was fairly middle class, lower to, to middle class, I guess. Um, but I eventually found my way to uh, Manhattan and Greenwich Village and um, largely through the high school I went to. Which was? Which was a uh, the High School of Music and Art in mm-hmm. Manhattan. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was a really special school. It's now called LaGuardia School of the Arts, but back then it was called the High School of Music and Art, and it was in Harlem. And uh, just uh, that's where I discovered folk music and where I really got involved in both music and art. I was an art student there, not a music student, um, and uh, made lifelong friends there and... Uh, you know, still I'm in touch with some of the people from my class. Oh, wow. Oh, that's great. Um, yeah. When did you and pick up a in, guitar, yeah. though? Were you, that was before high school? or? No, no, when I was in high school. That's when you, um, uh-huh. This was a school, yeah, the school had a lot of um, the kids there were from, you know, you could say left-wing families mm-hmm. uh, who were, you know, into folk music, you know, the Pete Seeger variety, mostly, and... uh you know, in my, not in my graduating class, but in school at the same time that I was there, uh, Peter Yarrow was one year ahead of me. Wow. Uh, and uh, Eric Weisberg, who's sadly passed away last year, but uh, he was off one year behind me. And uh, one of the great banjo players, if you're not familiar with Eric Weisberg, he was a guy who recorded Deliverance, uh, the, the theme from Deliverance, so dueling banjos wow. with Steve Mandel. So he was there, you know, and there were a lot of other musicians, obviously music students, who uh, were hugely talented, and some of them played folk music mm-hmm. That's along with their classical and jazz and the other things they were formally studying. Right, right. Um, and then, so, so that that woke me up to that whole uh, folk music world, and I got a guitar when I was, I think, a sophomore, maybe my first year in high school. Right. And I know you had a renowned um, teacher as well, your 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 mentor. Yes, yes. Um, I I started out with a with a guy who was also in a small way. He was a fairly successful studio musician named Walter Rame, 
uh, R-A-I-M. Uh, but my main influence, he, he got me started, but then a few years later, I studied with Brownie McGee, nice. a great blues uh, singer, songwriter, and guitar player, uh, who's still my, my biggest influence and hero uh, for, uh, in terms of my guitar playing. And I, I studied with him uh, in his, I went down to his apartment in East Harlem, you know, once a week for several months, and then over the years, you know, occasionally, and we became good friends, wow. although he was 20, 20 or so years older than me. Right. He was already an established, established he and Sonny Terry, mm-hmm. Ryan McGee and Sonny Terry were an established uh, act on the folk and blues, and actually he started out earlier on the R&B scene, which most people don't realize. Uh, he played electric guitar, too. Oh, wow. Uh-huh. Wow. Yeah. 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 Now, this whole scene started, you know, mid '60s, right? The Greenwich Village scene. How, tell me about how it started for you, and and what you just all started in a park on Sundays. How? Talk about. Yeah, you know, it really started before that. It started before my time. It started in the '40s, um, uh, as the folk scene, the you know, with Pete Seeger and the Almanac Singers and the Weavers and. Led Belly and Josh White and Woody Guthrie and all those people, they were more in the heydays in the 1940s. Uh, and by the 50s, it started to catch on where uh, high school kids and camp, kids that were going to camp, and the guitar started to get passed around uh, and, and banjos and stuff. And I would say Pete Seeger was a huge influence, um, as was, frankly, left-wing politics. Uh-huh. Um, and uh, I found my way to Washington Square Park, where every Sunday uh, between, you know, April and October, on nice days, people would gather and play music. And it was a huge, it, w- it was a hugely influential scene. Um, and I met people, again, people who I'm still friends with to this day, um, and other people who, sadly, we've lost, but um, people who became internationally known you know, music stars and, and other people that just went on to be, I don't know, lawyers or, you know, whatever, other things, but right, right. had that music in their background. And uh, it was like a proving ground for young pickers to go and there'd be bluegrass groups, there'd be uh, calypso singers, there'd be blues singers. Um, so I met people like Dave Van Ronk and um, uh, Mike Seeger and... Um, uh, Tom Paley and Eric Darling and these all these people who, you know, maybe their names are starting to fade out a little bit, but they were hugely influential mm-hmm. in folk and uh, later in, in folk rock and pop music. And lots uh, John of, Sebastian, oh, yeah. was an early, my, yeah. still my dear friend, was, was one of the uh, attendees there. <sighs> so, uh, you know, we, we go back that far. Amazing. Lots of clubs there, too, right? Hoot nannies and all kinds of... Well, clubs. yeah. So so when we first started playing in Washington Square, nobody had a thought in the world that you could make a living at this. <laughs> um, there were some there were some people that were becoming well-known. You know, Burl Lives, of course, was yeah. hugely... You know, Harry Belafonte became very well-known. Um, Odetta was starting to get well-known. People like that... Um, People who were making, a few people were making folk music records. And, of course, Pete Seeger was sort of the, the uh, I don't know, the, the star of, of most of it for us. Uh-huh, um, yeah. But other people were doing Then You know, by the 50s, the Kingston Trio came in. And then the folk scene started to evolve more into the small coffee houses and a few clubs that had liquor, you know, like the Village Gate or the... Gertie's Folk City started to sprout up, and yeah, maybe they, by that time, by the early 60s, there were dozens of little cafes and bars that had folk singers in them. It was cheap for them. Mm-hmm. You know, they could draw a crowd and not pay us much. Right. <laughs> we'd, pass the, we'd pass the basket, you know, and, and, uh, and get whatever change we could get out of people who weren't, you know, spending all their money on drinks or fancy coffees. Right. Um, and so, you know, uh, John Sebastian always had this line that said, you, if you went to one of these, they called them basket houses where they passed the basket, you did not want to follow Richie Havens because everybody's pockets would be empty after he <laughs> came 
came off the stage. <laughs> oh. uh, yeah, you, you want know. to make sure you precede so, Richie Haven. So oh, that's amazing. Right. That's right. Amazing. And then people started writing songs, especially, you know, po- uh, topical songs in those days. So that's when Phil Oaks and Tom Paxton and um, Buffy St. Marie and uh, Ian and Sylvia, all these people started, and Judy Collins coming on the scene, Joan Baez. So it became a really rich uh, kind of a melting pot of, of people from all over the country coming to the village and other parts. There are other centers, North Beach in, in San Francisco and parts of L.A. and Chicago. But Greenwich Village, to me, was the heart of it. Was the heart of it. And, of course, somebody yeah. starting out his career there, uh, Mr. Bob Dylan. Yeah, we met Bob shortly after he blew into New York, you know, from Minnesota. Um, uh, he was, you know, when I first met him, he was sleeping on people's floors and, you know, trying to get onto open mic nights uh, in places like the Cafe Wa and Gertie's Folk City. And uh, and we became friends early on through a, a mutual friend named Gil Turner, who was a, a singer and banjo player and song leader. Um, and I joined a group with Gil Turner called the New World Singers. Uh, uh, it was a yeah, quartet. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, the, and the New World Singers, Bob Dylan loved us. He used to come to all our shows when we did gigs in the, in the places like Gertie's Folk City or the Gaslight in New York. And, uh, and he, would, he would peddle his songs to us. So we were the first ones to ever record Blowing in the Wind. Amazing. Uh, 1960, late 1962, or early 63. Wow. Even before he had it on a record. So, so in uh, nineteen sixty two, wow. And wow, that's amazing. And and the New World Singers, that was your thing, and you were in the studio with him when he Yes. Yeah, for the we, first we, recording. We, we made a record. It was uh, I think it was early sixty three. We made a record uh that was a benefit for a magazine called Broadsides Magazine, uh, which was publishing in a very crude way, um, all of these singer-songwriters that I mentioned, Tom Paxton, Peter Lafarge, uh, Bob Dylan, um, uh, Phil Oaks, all these people that were writing furiously anti-war songs or uh, civil rights songs and that kind of thing. Um, so we did a, this record that was a benefit for that magazine so they could keep publishing because they weren't making any money putting this thing out. Um, and so my first time in a professional recording studio uh, was at Folkways Studio. Of course, Folkways was a, the great folk music record company of the day. Mm-hmm. And uh, in this one small studio was Bob Dylan and my group that I was in, the New World Singers, and Phil Oaks, who I met that day for the first time, uh, and Pete Seeger, wow. and uh, the Freedom Singers, who were from Albany, Georgia, this wonderful quartet of uh, civil rights singers who had come up north to raise money for the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and uh, several other musicians. Keith Lafarge, who was a kind of American Indian singer, he wrote the ballad of Ira Hayes, but uh, Johnny Cash later had a big hit with. Wow. So now, it was quite, a, quite an experience for my first time in a recording studio. You had met Dylan before going into the studio with him. Had you met, yeah. had you oh, met yeah. Pete Seeger? Um, I had met him kind of in passing. Uh, he was my my hero. He was the reason I started playing this music. And uh, I went to many, many concerts and brought all his records and um, scoured for any news I could get of him anywhere. Um, and I was in a concert with him. My first major concert in 1958 was called the New York Folk Festival. And he was on the stage with Get Red- Reverend Gary Davis and me and... Um, and several other people, but I didn't really meet him. We just happened to be, you know, on the same show at the same time. But this, so this is the first time that I actually was in a small room with Pete. Right. And then thereafter, I did, I did get to know him over the years fairly well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow. Which was a huge thing for me always. You know, he came, stayed with us here at the house, and oh. uh, I did many shows with him. And uh, uh, he was, he was, uh, just a, a big figure in in my life and so many other people's. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And of course, he made Beacon his home here in the Hudson Valley too. So, 
Um, oh, right. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah, yeah. What a soul. Actually, I should have mentioned, here's a story for you. that um, I think um, my the first time I really actually, I, I, I was mistaken a minute ago. I had met Pete before the at Town Hall concert I mentioned, mm-hmm. because Barry Kornfeld, who I used to play guitar with in Washington Square, he was a banjo player mostly, but we played together in Washington Square. We hitchhiked together down south <laughs> to uh, kind of meet the real folk, you know, in the Appalachia and all uh-huh. that stuff. Yeah. This was right out of high school. And Barry and I once, he, Barry somehow knew Pete, and we drove up to Beacon. And Pete was just sort of still building his log cabin there. Yeah. And his kids were very little. And uh, Barry said, I'm going up to see Pete. Do you want to come? And of course, to me, that was like, you know, wanting to meet God or something. <laughs> so of course I said, yes, yeah. I didn't have to die to do it. <laughs> so, um, so we got in Barry's mess, must have been his parents' car. I don't think he would have been able to have a car at that time. We drove up to Beacon and uh, it was the middle of the winter. And Pete loved to flood his driveway and let it ice over and then go ice skating on it. He always loved ice skating. <laughs> so the first thing we did when we got there, he said he found some skates that were hanging in some room in the cabin there somewhere, and we all went ice skating together. Uh. And his wife, Toshi, wasn't... But she came back as we were skating. I remember she drove up and just started to lay into him about, you haven't set the table. You haven't started the stove. You know what? You know you've got guests. What's going? You know what are you doing out here? You know, just sort of like bawling him out. And I was thinking, oh my God, this is this is Pete Seeger. She's yelling at Pete Seeger. You know? But that was that was Toshi. She she was a a wonderful. You know, they say without Toshi, there wouldn't have been Pete. Right. And I think that's. I think really Pete true. said that. I think Pete said that. Pete said that for sure. Yeah. yeah. And she was just a, a amazing person and. Uh, so we got to have dinner with them that night and with their little kids. Oh, uh, oh man! Uh, and then, um, and then we drove back to the city that night, Barry and I. And uh, and then later on, I, I, as I said, I got to know Pete more. On the road. Right, right, yeah. Wow, yeah. Well, yeah. Lucky he was right so, here. He was so right always, here. always just here, and and never was. What you saw on stage with Pete was a guy who he was. He was just that guy. He was that guy. Yeah. yeah. Always. Yeah. yeah. And of course, the beautiful Clearwater Festival that he started and oh, all, yeah. all the work that he did with that. It just, what a, what, oh, yeah. a, what a legend. And throughout the whole world. I mean, Pete Seeger, boy, he made the world a better place. That's for sure. That's he, for sure. He sure did. Yep. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. And, um, How'd you find Woodstock? You know, I knew about Woodstock when I was at the High School of Music and Art because in those days, in the 50s, the Art Students League was here, and some of the students from the school used to come up here in the summer and study at the Art Students League, the Art Students. And at least once or twice, I hitchhiked or managed to get my parents' car and drove up here to visit them up here. So I knew about Woodstock as an artist place. Um, but then in the, the 1965, I think it was, Jane and I drove up one summer day uh, to visit Billy Fair, the great, who was a wonderful banjo player who was living here, and also John Harold, who I knew from Washington Square and who was in the Greenbrier Boys, this really fantastic um, city bluegrass group, one of the first uh, urban bluegrass bands to make sort of national history and they they did a song that we, actually they taught Linda Runtz that different drum which were her first major hit you and I traveled to the beat of a different drum uh, so Johnny was here and so we came to visit him and we just fell in love with the place so the next year we rented a place for the summer mm-hmm. yeah. and then we rented the place again the next summer just a little cabin in the woods here in Bearsville and then uh that was it. We just said, "Why go back to the city?" Right, right. And then you yeah. raised your family and have been a yeah, Hudson Valley resident. And, and and when we came up, we got reacquainted with Bob Dylan, who, after his trajectory into the stratosphere, by <laughs> you know, like a Rolling Stone and all that stuff. But by the time we came up here, he was then um, 
kind of living a quiet life after his motorcycle accident. Right. So he was at Birdcliff. We right? reacquainted. He was in Birdcliff, yeah. And then we came to Birdcliff too. So then we became friends again during those years. Wow. So you all had little kids running around and, and still That's right. And yeah. still playing. And yeah. then you played with him again, right, in seventy one on another studio yes, album? That's right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, we did um we did four songs together in the studio. Uh, in New York, we came into New York and ended four songs, and they ended up on his greatest hits album. And uh, yeah, so that was that was quite a thrill for me to to do that. And then Dylan, uh, did he also invite you uh, along with uh, Allen Ginsberg? Yes, um, uh, he was producing in some. I mean, John Hammond was the nominal producer, the famous. John Hammond, record producer John Hammond. Um, uh, but Bob was actually putting together this uh, album for Allen Ginsberg, which was putting some of his poems to music and also some uh, Blake. Allen Ginsberg loved uh, the poet Blake, um, William Blake, and he put some of his poems to music. Mm-hmm. So we went down to the studio in New York, CBS Studios, I think it was, or the record plant, or one of the, I forget exactly right now, but uh, uh, there was a big group of musicians, and I came with them. I played bass. Really? For the first time ever, yeah. Wow. Bob said to bring a bass, and I didn't know how to play bass, but I figured <laughs> it out really fast. And so uh, so David Amram was there on the sh- on the show, which was, I mean, on the uh, session, which was I think my probably the first time I met uh, David, uh-huh, yeah. uh, who's who's actually speaking of which the song you played when we opened this uh, Deep Blue Sea, yes. the penny whistle on that was played by David Amram. Oh, really? That was him playing. He was him playing the penny whistle on that. Yeah. <sighs> This is such a wonderful oh. release that you have. I play it a lot, Happy. I dig it. Oh, thank you. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you. It, it's, it's really beautifully done. And one of those rare four-star reviews from Rolling Stones, too. It's like, yeah. And they were right on thank because, you. yeah, it's just beautifully done. Um, you have another album coming out? I know you were working on things. You know, I started one just before the COVID thing hit. Yes. So in the late winter of what would it have been 2019 i guess i cut three or four songs but i never even had a chance to go then then i went to california for six weeks or something then came back and COVID hit so i haven't even had a chance to listen in the studio to those songs that i did right but i had i did some so i did maybe five songs Mm-hmm. Uh, and I had some great players with me. I had John Sebastian and Cindy Cash Dollar, ah, and Byron Isaacs on bass. Love and, them uh, all. Eric Parker on drums. Wow. And uh, Jeff Moldar came in and sang harmony on one song with me. Well, I hope it but comes to pending. fruition for you. <laughs> it will eventually when we're all safely vaccinated. You can go back to the studio, and I have to figure out another half a dozen songs to do, and then. Uh, so I don't know when it'll get done, but I'm hoping it will. It you know, will. I still have to get in and, and give it some serious work, but uh, I'm hoping it'll be, you know, something worthy. Oh, it will be. It will be. Absolutely. Anything coming from you always is happy. You don't put out oh. anything that's not top notch. Um, did you go to the Woodstock Festival in, in 69? I did not. Uh-huh. I know I you was, went to Newport. I was in Woodstock. Oh, Yeah. Yeah. I went to Newport and I, two years in a row, 68 and 69, with my brother, Marty. Um, you know, I, a couple of friends of mine and I got in a car and we started heading to Bethel. And we figured, you know, we know all the back roads. We're natives around here now since I've been living there for all of three years. <laughs> uh, so uh, we started heading down there and, we suddenly realized that all the cars on this small road that we decided to take, the shortcut, so to speak, were all going in the same direction in all, in both lanes, oh two lane road. Oh boy! And we and and I just said, you know what? If we go in, we're not getting out. Right. And so we, we I just convinced the guy who was driving, a friend of mine, to go up on the shoulder of the road and drive a mile or so on people's lawns and things <laughs> just to get going the other direction and get back home. 
So we watched the news at, on TV at Dini's, which was the, it's now long gone, but the, the really famous uh, restaurant and bar here in Woodstock for many, many years, kind of a legendary place. We sat at the bar and watched the TV over the bar and saw the state troopers closing down the throughway and all that stuff. And happy that you weren't but, there, I'm sure. You were probably I, like... I'm, to this day, to this day, you know, if I... If I wasn't on a helicopter going in with the bands or yeah. being on the stage, I didn't want to be on. You know, I just didn't know. Yeah. It was my, never my style. So. Right, right, right. More of the Newport is much more. If you wouldn't mind, Happy, yeah. I'd love to ask you about your brother. And, sure, um, and, of and course. just um, obviously you're blood related, but talk deeper when you guys got together for music and how you were both so synchronous in the music and the styling was he with you going to the village and playing on sundays and all of that where did your partnership in as musicians come together right he he did he was a little behind me because i was five years older Mm -hmm. so when i started playing he was way younger than you know if i started at 16 he was you know 11 or 12 or whatever so um but then he started. He first started playing the banjo a little bit, mm-hmm. and uh, I think he was kind of following in my footsteps. And I have a wonderful picture that I show in this. Uh, you know, I'm doing one of the things that I'm doing on on Friday. It'll be a. It's been pre-recorded, but it's it's the show that I do called Coming of Age in the Folk Revival. And there's a wonderful picture of me in Washington Square at about the age of sixteen. Uh, probably eighteen, and then Artie as a young maybe just barely a teenager sitting in the same picture. So there he was in Washington Square oh, with me. Young. Um, okay. But he, yeah, very young. And then, but then we kind of, you know, when I was starting my career, he was not, he was still in school, you know, and, um, but pretty quickly, uh, I realized he was starting to overtake me <laughs> as a musician. Um, And it was only, it was probably in the mid to around 1967, 60, well, actually in 65, we, we joined together in a rock and roll band called the Children of Paradise. And we were based in the village. We were a, a, first a quartet, then a quintet. And we were playing very Beatles influenced rock and roll. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I was frankly terrible at it. Um, and already started, I was realizing already started writing songs and being really good on the guitar. And he was actually in one of the earliest, uh, versions of the blues project, which if you really? know, it was a very, yeah, he was, I think he, I think Danny Kalb later took his place wow. in that group. He was never on a record with them, uh-huh. but he played around the village with them. And uh, by the time we got together, as it, after the Children of Paradise broke up, and I moved to Woodstock, a year later he came to Woodstock, and then we started seriously starting to play together. And playing together was just like, somehow it just fell into place. Um, and he had guitar chops that I couldn't even attempt. Wow. So most of, most of our career together, which went on for about, on and off, not 100%, but mo- for about 40 years, mm. Um, he would take the most of the lead playing on the guitar, and I would do most of the rhythm. I mean, we we did take some turns, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, and we made we made uh, four albums together, two for Capitol, which is you know a big record label yeah, at the yeah, time, sure, uh, which is a whole other story, which I could go on for another hour. <laughs> I won't get into, but. Um, Albert Grossman, who was our manager, mm-hmm. uh, through the good graces of Bob Dylan and the band, who we became friendly with, and some other of Albert's uh, uh, clients, uh, he got me the he got us the deal with Capitol Records, and so we became part of a pretty big record company. Yeah, you did. Um, yeah. Um, wow. And we made a couple of records that people still say are collector's items, but that's because they sold so poorly but 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 people do you know constantly bring them up and and i see them online for fifty dollars or whatever you know wow. hundred dollars for a for vinyl record right right yeah um and and then after that we just we went out with a lot of albert's 
groups opening shows all over the country for Albert Grossman's. Act. We opened for Tom Rush and um, Richie Havens and the band and uh, uh, Gordon Lightfoot and uh, Paul Butterfield Blues Band. All these groups, we would go out and do opening shows for them. And then we started doing our own shows at colleges all around the, mostly in the Northeast. Yeah, yeah. And so we had a we had a career going. We um, we made a couple of folk records with the Woodstock Mountains Review, which we produced. And with both, then we went back to our folk music roots, really. Right, right. Yeah. But Artie, then Artie, Artie did a lot of um, other genres of music. Especially, he loved what they used to call uh, cool jazz. Oh yeah, yeah, sure. And he made a lot of records that were kind of in that cool jazz category, which was co- totally out of my wheel box i couldn't couldn't go there but uh he did some beautiful work with a lot of great great artists jazz artists and uh you know just he was just a hugely talented wonderful guy and and he's you know i just feel his loss all the time i know i know i can imagine he's deeply missed for sure yeah 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 mm-hmm. yeah absolutely. plus he was funny as hell <laughs> he's one of the funniest people we you need know, some of that right stage. now don't we talk to I me know, we really do like you were around in the 60s with all that political unrest and the civil rights and all of that compare that time during what we're going through if you would for me what you think of that compare well, you know the you know, yeah, I think it started out being the the movement was anti nuke and pro civil rights, uh, kind of peace and civil rights that kind of thing. A little later, I guess the women's movement started up, probably ten years later or so. And I, I think I'm not a historian, but probably in the early to mid seventies. But but when Vietnam got really bad. Then it, it got seriously scary, and it was really, you know, the divisions of this country were kind of like they are now in some ways. Mm-hmm. If you had long hair and you went, you left certain parts of the country and went into other parts, you were in danger of getting beaten up or, or worse. I mean, uh, when we were on the road with the Children of Paradise, I remember uh, some of our gigs took us out of town, and we had long hair, and, and we go into a diner or something, and... and Boy, we get some bad, bad really? looks. Really, and yeah. uh, you know, and you remember the weatherman was blowing up bombs off, and you know, they were, you know, robbing banks, and you know, it was revolutionary time because of Vietnam, because of the draft, um, and then civil rights with all the assassinations, Martin Luther King and Bobby Kennedy, and I've been mentioning John F. Kennedy earlier, but it was it was a fraught, horrible time as well, but somehow. Nothing compares for me to the last four years culminating in this insurrection at the Capitol. I mean, that was beyond anything I've ever seen, even with all the stuff that went on in the, in the 60s and And early that was 70s. just two weeks ago. Yeah, unbelievable. And now we have the feeling of hope and optimism again right. for the first time. Right, right. So I feel so good about that. Good. Good, good. Yeah, I hope I hope unity starts, and I hope people leave the hate behind. Because, uh, uh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. We need to move on. Um, Happy, you're an author, also. You wrote your first, uh, book, I, um, right? Didn't you write like a book in yeah. the '60s? I wrote a, I wrote quite a few uh, guitar instruction books, primarily. Um, I wrote a couple of just texts as well, but um, not. I'm not a novelist or a historian or anything like that, but I wrote like at least a dozen guitar instruction books. Mm -hmm. The first one was in 1965. I wrote a book after I left the New World Singers. I was was a guitar teacher for many years, and I wrote a book called Finger Picking Styles for Guitar. And that's still in print, right? Still in print, yes. It's still in print after, I don't know, what is how many years is that? 55 something, years. something yeah. 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 Yeah, 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 55. So it's been a continual print since it came out. Uh, and uh, it was the first book of its kind. It was a book that I transcribed painstakingly the guitar playing of some of the people whose who's playing we, we loved most, you know, people like Mississippi John Hurt 
and Merle Travis and Elizabeth Cotton, some of the forerunners of the of the finger picking world today, uh, which is acoustic playing, finger style playing, and uh, then also contemporary people like Dave Van Ronk and Tom Paley and Mike Seeger and people like that. So I transcribed all these things so people could learn what they what they were doing off of music and tablature. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. And when I started hearing from people that they couldn't find the records, but they, they were trying to learn from the book sold very, very well. Mm-hmm. Um, but people were having trouble getting off the printed page, what the thing was supposed to really sound like. So this is when I started making tapes. And this is to, homespun. That was homespun. Right. That was the start of homespun. Right. Talk more about uh, that if you would. Please. Well, so, you know, I, I decided to make a, a series of... First, I was going to make lessons just for my students because I was trying to go on the road with Artie and uh, going out of town. And, and so I thought, well, I'll just make tapes for my students. But that was really labor-intensive. So I thought if I could make a series of tapes that I could, Everybody, you know, one tape for a lot of people. Yeah. Or one series. So I made a series of tapes based on that book, Figure Picking Styles for Guitar. And in those days, it was reel-to-reel tapes. Remember, most people, nowadays, people don't even know what a tape is. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so, they barely but, know what a CD were, is anymore. That's right. That's right. <laughs> so uh, it was reel-to-reel tapes. And uh, we put out little ads in magazines like Sing Out. And the same year I started was the same year Guitar Player Magazine started. Wow. So I put little ads in Guitar Player Magazine. Yeah. Um, and a couple of Rolling Stones started that year, and I put a few little ads, classified ads in Rolling Stone, and people started writing away for some tapes. So Jane and I started uh, running off you know, copies. We'd have a master tape, and we'd run off copies on our kitchen table. Oh. Um, and then Jane would pack them up and take them to the post office and send them out, and it just started to grow from there. And then I thought, well... I could make more of these, or I could ask my friends to start making tapes. Uh-huh. Yeah. So Bill, Bill Keith had recently moved. Bill Keith was a great, great five-string banjo, bluegrass-style player, and he moved to Woodstock, so I got him to make a series of tapes on banjo playing. I got Artie to make some tapes on his guitar style. Um, I got, uh, you know, just started asking friends to make tapes for us, and then cassettes came in. That was a big deal. Yeah. So we got a high-speed cassette duplicator, and then we, we could, you know, it just grew from there. And then in the early 80s, it started with VHS tapes, yeah. video. Mm-hmm. And now it's all downloadable. Now you, our entire catalog of, we have over 600, actually, Amazing. lessons. And it's still growing now. Amazing. Even. I want to direct people yeah. to that website because there are so <laughs> many great artists and instructional videos and music on their homespun.com. And you can also go to right. happy um, to get through right. to homespun. And you've had some right. amazing we lucky artists. Enough, lucky enough to get people like Dr. John and uh, Donald Fagan and Pete Seeger and Bill Monroe and Ralph Stanley and uh, Tony Rice and, um, uh, uh, Sam Bush and you know just world class Bela Fleck world class players who made instructional tapes for us through the years yeah. uh, and we have a so our catalog goes back to the to the seventies. That's amazing. You know, and and it's just wow. a you know, and and a lot of local a lot of local artists. John Sebastian, Jack D. Jeanette made tapes made a video for. I think Jim Weeder too, right? Jim Jim Weeder and yep. Levon Helm and Rick Danko, um, you know all these local heroes yep. uh, made made tapes for us. So, you know we feel you know we went into some some jazz, some pop. Mostly it's rootsy kind of blues and and folk and bluegrass, but also some some other kinds of music too. We have some Tex-Mex music and some Celtic Irish. Music. Paul Brady, for instance, wow. made a, yeah. a video for us. So, you know, we feel like, you know, very uh, fortunate to have had all these amazing musicians come and, and make lessons. And what a library you have there now that you've collected over all these 50 years. Amazing. Um, 
Yeah, thanks. You, you've got this great event coming up Friday night. People can buy tickets online. Yes. Talk about it. It's called Coming of Age in the Greenwich Village Folk Revival and the Woodstock Scene. Right. So this is a show that I've been doing live around the country. Um, and even in London, I did it uh, a couple of years ago, uh, which is basically I tell stories kind of like what I'm telling you uh, with the help of some uh old photos, which I show as slides, and audio clips of records that made a big difference to me. And a group uh, called River Spirit Music and Connecticut Folk asked me to do this for them. Yeah. So uh, they uh, we recorded it at the Bearsville Studio, which is beautifully renovated gorgeous. now. I mean, gorgeous, gorgeous. Uh, it's, it's amazing, yeah. gorgeous place now. With, I mean, it, it, I can't wait for it to actually be open again because it's so beautiful. Yep. So we went in We went in there with the camera crew and um, recorded, and John Sebastian and Cindy Cash Dollar, two of my, my dearest friends, came and helped out with the songs. So we did about maybe 10 or so songs. Uh-huh. I don't remember the exact number, which are interspersed with my just telling stories and showing pictures of of uh, my early life in in music, oh. and I think that's uh, it's it's a really neat thing to have uh, showing online, and that'll be at seven thirty this Friday. Yeah, and uh, um, you can go to my face my Facebook page has a link to it, and uh, I guess you can somehow I don't know how we can let people know to go there aside from. Right. It's 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 the Happy Traum Facebook page. Um and on there is an event. And actually you can just type in Happy Traum Coming of Age and this event just pops up and you can get all the oh, information good. there. I think there's a link that sign up there and um it does start seven thirty this Friday, the twenty second. So that's how you right. can do that. If anybody missed any of that, you can always message me on local motion Facebook page as well. But just happy traum if you if you check into Happy Traum, you will find this event and how great with your friends John Sebastian and Cindy Cash Dollar that you've got this oh, yeah. event going on. And then you've got a busy weekend ahead, uh, Mr. Traum, yes. because on Sunday yes. you're doing a workshop. Yes, uh, the the legendary uh, Old Town School of Folk Music in Chicago has asked me to do a guitar workshop, which will be live on Zoom. Awesome. Uh, unlike unlike the coming of age, which is or pre recorded, mm-hmm. this will be live, yep. and it'll be Sunday morning at eleven our time, ten central, um, and it's going to be a two hour guitar workshop for kind of early intermediate players. I don't think I'm going to get too fancy with it, but I'll kind of try to assess the level of people who are joining me. Yeah, uh, and it'll be on how do, how I arrange some Bob Dylan songs. Nice. So I'm going to take some well-known classic Dylan songs and show what I can do to make them my, what I do to make them my own or how people can make them their own songs. Um, they're not how Bob played them. They're how I might approach them with a finger style guitar yeah. uh, approach. And, um, you know, and, and the things that I'm going to show are applicable to any songs. It's not going to be only for these songs, but, you know, I'll probably take a song like Don't Think Twice, It's All Right, and uh, show how you can just accompany yourself, add some things to make it special, maybe finger pick a solo on it, that kind of thing. Right, right. And I'll probably have time in the two hours for maybe four or five different songs. Right. Oh, it sounds so exciting. And that, again, is on yeah. your, I listed on your Facebook page, too. I think I saw a post yes. of it this morning or something. So, um, yeah, yes. that, that guitar workshop is happening Sunday the 24th. Again, happy trail. Yeah, Just the Facebook and they page. Go to, they can go to the Old Town School also and, and find it there under their events. Right. Right. Old Town School, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, you know, and I'm I'm thrilled to be there. They've been around almost as long as I have. They've been around for <laughs> more than fifty years too. They're a very influential place in in Chicago and around the country. You got any um, any more books coming your way, like an autobiography or anything? <laughs> uh, I keep getting asked that. I don't know. Uh huh. 
Uh, Jane, Jane has asked me after me for that uh-huh. too. I have to, I have to figure out how I can do it. Yeah. Uh, and not make it every every waking moment for the next five years. <laughs> right. Uh, right. I'm thinking about it. Good, good. I think it would be yeah. um, kind of interesting. I know your buddy Yorma um, wrote an oh, yeah. incredible book and just so open right. and soul bearing and just really yeah. amazing book. So, um, yeah. Yeah. And Yorma's another one who's done several uh, instructional videos for Homespun. Yeah. Yeah. And you've been Yorma, out to Fur Yorma Peace. And, Jack. and you've been oh, out I to go, Fur Peace. I've been, yeah. Every year for 20 years. Yeah. This past year, because of COVID, was the only one I've missed uh, for the last, I think it's been 20 years. And I'm hoping we'll all be well enough uh, this summer for yes. me to go back. Yeah, I hope so, too. I hope so, too. I think uh, <laughs> yeah. Yorma's waiting for everybody, too. So, yeah, it's uh, wonderful. Happy. I just yeah. thank you for your time. It's just so great talking with you and hearing the stories and hearing your your message for today and just hopeful and just, you know, I don't yeah, know. Absolutely. It, yeah. You kind of make well, me feel you, like Lydia. everything's going to be okay. So, um, yeah. <laughs> you know, well, I sure hope so. Yeah, I think yeah. so. I think so. I'm going to play some more of your, of your music. I'm going to send people to your happy uh, website, also homespun.com and your Facebook page, which again, people can check you out this weekend. You've got two opportunities great. to see happy, right? Friday night and, um, Sunday at 11 AM. So great things happening right. with you. And, and, thank you for the gift of music that you've given to so many, to so many generations. And just thank you, Happy. You uh, you definitely make the world a better place, too. So happy to have you oh, in it. Thanks. And thank you for your time today. And we're going to keep playing some of your music. Wonderful. All right. Thanks, Rita. We'll talk to you next okay. time. Stay safe. Bye-bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Ah, it's 4.57. You are tuned into Local Motion here on 91.3 WVKR. Always an honor talking with the legendary folk artist, Mr. Happy Traum. Let's take a listen to some music from him right here, right now. This one's called High Muddy Water, 91.3. The water's deep and wide I can't hold out long this way But if I can stem the tide, perhaps I'll find a way. Now I'll swim ashore, cause I must make it. Oh, I'm up to my neck, and I.
I'm Happy Traum, and you're listening to Rita Ryan on Local Motion on 91.3 WVKR, Independent Radio, Poughkeepsie, New York. I'm a poor, unlucky chap, I'm very fond of rum. I walk the road from morn till night, I ain't ashamed to bum. My feet being sore, my clothes being tore, still I didn't complain. I got up and hoisted my turkey and I walked the road again. I'll walk the road again, my boys, I'll walk the road again. If the weather be fair, I'll comb my hair and walk the road again. From New York into Buffalo, I tramped it all the way. I slept in brickyards and old log barns till the break of day. Feet sore, clothes tore, still I didn't complain. I got up and hoisted my turkey and I walked the road again. I walked the road again, my boys, I'll walk the road again. If the weather be fair, I'll comb my hair and walk the road again. Well, I worked in the Susquehanna yards, I made a dollar a day. Toiling hard to make a living, boys, I hardly think she pays. They said they'd pay good wages, if they do, I won't complain. If they don't, I'll hoist my turkey and I'll walk the road again. I'll walk the road again, my boys, I'll walk the road again. If the weather be fair, I'll comb my hair and I'll walk the road again. along for about a month and then I got some cash. We went out on a spree, my boys, my money went to smash. Devil of a cent did I have left, yet I didn't complain. I got up and hoisted my turkey and I walked the road again. I walked the road again, my boys, I walked the road again. If the weather be fair, I comb my hair and walk the road again. On the road again to a place I do not know. Misfortune, you are cruel. Why did you treat me so? The devil that sits upon my back, that's what makes me sore. If ever I get a job again, I'll walk the road no more. I'll walk the road no more, my boys. I'll walk the road no more. If ever I get a job again, I'll walk the road no more. Ninety-one three WVKR Independent Radio, Poughkeepsie, New York. That was Happy Traum. Thank you to Happy for being my guest today during the four o'clock hour. If you missed part or all of that interview, you can certainly tune in later to or check it out later at the Local Motion Facebook page as well as YouTube. Um, I'm under Rita Ryan Local Motion on there. We just heard Happy Traum with. Um, his release from 2005 called I Walk the Road Again, and that was the title track from that. And we also heard Happy's uh, track from Just for the Love of It, what canned which comes out in 2015, came out in 2015, and it's called Hi Muddy, happytraum.com. Again, he's doing a concert on Friday with John Sebastian and Cindy Cash Dollar, happytraum.com, and his Facebook page. You can check out that out, as well as the online guitar workshop, um, which is happening on Sunday, and all that information is online if you care to take a look. We're going to keep the music flowing here because that's what we do on Local Motion. I'm your host, Rita Ryan, here each and every Wednesday from 4 to 6 p.m. playing music of the Hudson Valley. Let's uh, let's start this off with, I think I've got Scott Sherrard plugged in. Let's take a listen right here, right now on 91.3. <laughs> I 
You're changing with the tide, girl, and running me all night.
That's the way it's done. 5.14 p.m. by Pete Levin, Mobius. And that's the track release. And we heard promises off of Pete Levin's 2017 release. Amazing musicians on here with him, including Nanny Assis, Jeff Chiampa, Alex Foster, Pete Levin, of course, Tony Levin, Chris Payson, Lenny White. Whew, this one's a hot one. Pete Levin. Dot com. Check out his discography if you're not already familiar with Pete. He's quite the artist, that's for sure. And getting us started on this sweet little duo set, Scott Sherrard, his latest release, Saving Grace. We heard high cost of loving you. Scott will be doing a live stream event from the beautiful Bearsville Theater on February 18th. You can visit bearsvilletheater.com and get tickets and see that. They do a quality job. They're beautiful camera work. The sound is just top notch. Scott Gerard is was the lead guitarist and musical director with Greg Allman for about a decade and is now part of the group Little Feet. So pretty good stuff. He's an amazing guitarist. I think I'm going to try to have him back on the air. Um, maybe just in time for that show. I'll have to reach out and see if he's available. So Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. 516 on this Wednesday. Let's keep the music flowing. Mr. Robert Saracen Blake, who comes to the Hudson Valley pretty frequently. I don't think he has because of the pandemic, but um, he sent me this song and he does play a lot with the guys from the Building Records in Marlboro. So I'm going to play this track. I'm pretty sure he intended this for today. And it's called Margin, A Margin of Millions. Let's take a listen to Robert Saracen Blake right here, right now on 91.3. <laughs> Everybody knew he was lying, even those who thought he was God. They couldn't explain their thinking, what to look behind the facade. They just knew it made him feel better than they'd ever felt before. He was the guy they could not deny the chance to be restored. Not all of them were rich and greedy, though a lot of them were. Some of them were needy. Needing someone to adore Someone who told it like it is Using language rough and clear They got a cake from this hotel prick Famous for saying you're fired I believe in you, he said The uninformed are my friends I'll tell you what's true, he said The start, the middle, and end the newspapers are lying to you They don't want you to be right I'm gonna make this country once again A great place to be white And the people that knew started dying From a disease they couldn't see Your man kept on lying Telling them not to believe The snowflakes, the lip tart Slack belly and soft spine but disease doesn't wave a flag and leaves the dead behind Hard to turn around when you're on a path Even harder to switch teams It's culture, it's tradition It's what you believe but it's hard to defend the behavior The lies make you tired Millions in November Said, hey buddy, you're fired By a margin of millions Hey buddy, you're fired Undesired Our country in shame you admire Your meat that's expired Exit is required No longer admired You haven't been rehired By a margin of millions 